Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to Jason Creoles. We're having a blast here. Dr. Frank Hall, my road trip buddy. And uh, Jason, so kind to let us hang out with them after a day at the bowling alley. Took the family bowling. Yes, we did. We uh, we lit it up the lanes, man. 157, 136. What was your scores? Something about pathetic like that. I walked out with a paper bag on my head. Man. So it's good to be here in Alabama. My producer's from Alabama, Mr. Producer. He is. A, isn't he a big Alabama fan? Big time. Big yeah, time. That's great. You don't find many small Alabama fans. Everybody says, I'm a big, especially when they're winning. You know, back when uh, Mike Shula was the coach, there was a lot of small time closet Alabama fans. But now that Nick Saban's the coach, everybody's a big Alabama fan. Yeah, I like that YouTube video where he talked about, like, if you're a high perform, high performers, hang around high performers. Yes. And if you're, a, if you're not carrying your weight, you ain't going to make it around here. And I, I think that even implies to business. Yeah, I think so. You know the video I'm talking about, his little speech? Who who, who said Coach that? Coach Saban. He said that. Yeah, he's kind of a driven personality. You know, I don't think he wakes up thinking, I don't know if I'm going to go to work today. Mail it in today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I might just take the day off. You know, he's pretty motivated. He drove by you one time in a Mercedes, correct? He drove by. He wasn't driving. He had a, he had a driver. But, yeah, he, he has a, You he were owns, out just spraying or? Yeah, he was right around here, but we, we have some really good high school football in the area, so I'm pretty sure he was visiting one of our big Recruit. time recruits around here. And you just popped your head up, and you're like, that's Coach Saban. I mean, it's hard to miss him. He's about, by far the most famous person in the state, I'm pretty sure. You know, the only, only person I – well, you know, Charles Barkley's from Alabama. He nah, Nick Saban over Barkley well, any day. Locally, I mean, Saban would be more popular. But in nationwide, I don't know. More people probably recognize Charles Barkley. But he doesn't live here now. You know, he just he's he lives him. in Atlanta, don't he? I thought he lived out in like Arizona, but I don't know. Oh, maybe but probably. He, but he probably. works in Atlanta a lot because of the Turner stuff. But yeah, he's yeah. from he's from Leeds, which is about twenty minutes from where I live. Yeah. Okay, but he went to the other school. Yeah, he did go to, to Auburn. Okay. Uh, Dr. Yeah, Frank yeah. went to Georgia Tech. <laughs> yeah, and did you know that the uh, Alabama fight song mentions Georgia Tech in their fight song? Did you know that? I didn't know that. Yeah. It talks about um, sending uh, – it's a derogatory statement to Georgia Tech because it's a rival. Not these days, but back in the day. And it, it mentions something about bringing the Yellow Jackets to a water waterly grave. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think if we played this year, it would end too well for the, uh, <laughs> the rambling wreck or whatever they yeah. call them over there. Georgia Tech ramp. What are y'all, Frank? Yeah, the rambling wreck. Uh huh. Okay, but you can't. You you can't. You got to be smart to graduate from Georgia Tech. It's an impressive university. You're good in science and engineering. Yeah. Yeah, and if we had a math test, I'd take Georgia Tech over Alabama any day. <laughs> yeah. But on football I think I would field, too. it might be a little, I little, would too. A little tough. In fact, I'd take Auburn over Alabama for the engineering and the math. Uh, they're the uh, ag school, you know, yeah. so they call it Cal College. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I got you. So you, most of you all know uh, our guest today, Jason Creel. He's been on YouTube for 10 years or so. He's got over 80,000. You're, you're pushing 90,000. I'm trying. I'm YouTube trying. subscribers over there got an invitation back to the Hype House with that uh, with that following. And uh, – are you getting pumped for the hype house, man? Second second year, did you block off some time? We're, we're planning to come. I don't, you know, my my uh, excitement level doesn't change a uh. lot for day to day, you know. So I'm not, I'm not saying I, we had a great time and we're looking forward to going. Do you, do you again. think Alan's going to invite us back out on the boat or what? I don't know. We might have to get a different captain if we do. Really? I don't know. Yeah. You know, I saw Captain Gene because um, I stayed at the hotel there at the marina because mm -hmm. I, I was still on my tour for a while afterwards. I was walking by and he walked by and I was like, "Hey, Captain Gene." He's like, "Hey." Did he did he I make derogatory I, I comments? Think he, about I think he me? mentioned something, but I something it was just an it light light Bama boy. But <laughs> well, I went with a guy about uh, he was uh, calling him Bama boy. We went about a week ago. I went with a couple of fertilizer friends down the coast of Alabama. We caught about sixty speckled trout, so we had a good time. Where do y'all fish? This was all close to. Um, it was actually in Bayou La Battery, Alabama, where all the shrimp boats are, you know, like okay. Bubba Gump kind of stuff. <laughs> um, but down on the coast of, uh, you know, near Dolphin Island and places like that, if you're familiar with those areas. Okay, so there, there's the uh, 
There's beaches in, in Alabama. Yeah, we have a little bit of like Gulf Shores is probably the most well known one. But yeah, down there on the coast, we do have a little bit of beach area, not not as much as Florida, but they're you know comparable in the beauty of them, like the uh, Florida beaches. It's down there in Mobile area. Yeah, down close to Mobile. That's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's nice down there. Yeah. So Jason, give everyone who maybe isn't familiar with your backstory just a little abbreviated version because you've bought. Pardon me. You've built multiple businesses mm-hmm. and sold them, and now you're in a wheelhouse with Furt and Squirt. Yeah, so when I – this was uh, been a while now, but uh, at one point in my life, I kind of came to a, a dead end. I had I had probably 15 jobs, and I'm not exaggerating. I had some terrible jobs. I, I sold copier machines. I worked at Waffle House. I worked at McDonald's. I've worked at a data entry for a bank. I worked uh, killing termites at a big – pest control place i worked this place where we built uh train cars like like full flat restored old train cars and then i went with a friend of mine over to germany and played baseball for six months really and uh yeah and and so when i came back i was kind of at a stage of life i was like i gotta you know i gotta do something i gotta quit being a loser you know and then working all these loser jobs and i had a college degree and did did well in school and all that but so I just I thought about joining the military. I thought about uh, I went over to Germany working with my buddy who's a, a pastor. I thought about maybe going back over there, and I but then I thought or maybe start a business. So what I did, I bought this book. It's called uh, by Dan, <laughs> Dan Miller is the guy's name, and it's forty eight forty eight days. days of work you love, and then he had one forty eight days of creative income. You know I've always won stuff. I don't know why, but even when I bought that. I, I I got this email or something. They called me and said, Jason, you won the uh, GPS giveaway. And I won with a Garmin GPS back when those were cool. And uh, <laughs> and I was I just started my line business. I was like, you know, and I won a permagreen at the GIE and all this other stuff. But anyway, um, I got that thing and I, I read that book and I, I always had this desire to start my own business. And I was like, well, what can I do? So I started a, a mowing business and it was, I mean, I had all these terrible jobs. So it wouldn't have to be. It you didn't even like, mention the coupon career. No, that was actually after, yeah, during, I started a coupon book business. That was a huge mistake. That was, um, that's what they say. I heard somebody talk about if you want to, uh, if you start a bait and tackle shop, he said, you know how you make a million dollars with a bait and tackle shop? He said, you got to start with $2 million. I said, that's about the way it is with a coupon book business. So you start with $2 million, you might let get out of there with a million. So um, anyway, I didn't, I wasn't the person for that. I'm not saying it's a bad business, but uh, anyway. Well, yeah, so I started my mowing business, and it was like right off the bat, I got this neighborhood interest where it was paying me $1,025 a month year-round, and I could get out there and mow in no time. I mean, I went through long periods of time in my life where that was a good uh, two-week paycheck. If I made that, I was thrilled, and I was going out there and just mow that yard, mow this interest way, a small interest way. take probably two hours by myself to do it. Was that commercial or residential? I mean, it was just like a neighborhood. It was just, you know, houses in there, and so the, uh, it was a property management association. Oh, yeah. that, so I bid on it, and I had, you know, this guy helped me put the bid, and I put the bid, and they called me and told me I got it. I said, <laughs> all I got to do is mow this little strip of grass right here. At the, y'all go pay. I didn't know what the bid. He told me put that down. I put it down. They said yes. I thought, and I kept it for like five years. It was awesome. I, I did. They did ask me to cut my price a couple of times, but I thought it still was great. And then it was this neighborhood. They were building these little bitty spec homes, and there was uh, they had about twenty of them in the neighborhood that weren't sold yet. And so the builder gets with me, and he says, "Hey, can you cut all these yards?" And they were like many of them on the same street so like literally i didn't i didn't uh, have to edge them or anything he just wanted to cut and weedy i would like get the mower and i'd just drive through about five or six backyards in a row cutting them i charged you 20 bucks and i was cutting like 20 spec homes for 20 bucks it was like 400 dollars. it'd probably take me like two hours or so and doing the interest way i thought this is the greatest job i ever had so that's kind of my starting lawn business and then the next year I bought out a guy who was getting out of the business. Actually, what he, he did, if I, I, he was selling lawnmowers, and he told me if I he was selling his equipment. He said if I bought two of his mowers, he'd give me the customers. <laughs> so I bought a walker mower and some big 60-inch thing that I turned right around and sold. And I kept the walker, and he gave me some really good accounts, some commercial accounts that paid uh, great. So that was a big uh, boost to me, especially for my year-round income because a lot of those were year-round payments. So anyway, after about five years, somebody approached me, bought that business. Um, I 
had then turned around. I kept a small portion of my business, but I had a non-compete. It was very restrictive, so I wasn't able to do great. And I, I did that for two years. Then we moved, and I had sold the rest of that business and the equipment. And I moved here, and I started over again. I moved two hours away, and I'm, I started mowing and spraying and doing the weed control thing. And after about three years, I gave up the mowing altogether. I, I traded actually a guy to, I just gave him my little bit of customers I had if he would cut my grass for a year. So he did that and he's actually still in business and watches us on YouTube a lot and he's doing, doing great. But anyway, um, I, so then I've been doing weed control exclusively since then. It's going great. Tell us a little bit more about that decision. It was Alabama Turf Pros, this last business you're currently on. My current business is Alabama Lawn Pros. Oh, yeah. Alabama Lawn Pros. Forgive me. What what motivated you to drop the mowing division? Because at, at one point you're like, this is great money. This is incredible. Yeah. And then you, you had another epiphany with Furt and Squirt. And you t- walk us through your process of why you let go of the mowing. Yeah. Well, for me, I think when I try to advise people, I'm like, you try to picture what you want to become five, ten years from now. You know, so I was in this situation. When we moved here. I had three kids and maybe a fourth on the way. And. I had no customers, not not one customer, you know, and I was like, no income, and I was like, I mean, I had some money from selling my business, but not a whole lot, honestly, after my coupon book debacle, <laughs> so uh, anyway, I had to make money, so I mean, I was, I was every time I've started, uh, well, I say every time, I know at least twice when I started my lawn business, I've worked a part-time job, and I was even, when I moved here, I was working at my in-laws have a wedding venue, if you've ever been to our conference, they they do weddings there. I was even working weekends, helping with the weddings. So just trying to make ends meet. So, um, but then the first year, you know, I got about a hundred customers, but I, you know, just mowing, what, what had happened, Paul was, I was just thinking, I don't think I want to be a huge company. I'm trying to do YouTube, trying to mow, trying to spray. And I would be out there, um, spraying and, or let's say I'd be out there mowing one day. I try to keep my mowing on two days and spray, but I'd be out there mowing and somebody'd call and want me to come give them a quote for spraying. So here I am pulling up with a truck and trailer lawnmowers. And it just, I felt like it just kind of, you know, people wanted somebody that was just spraying. You know, if you want to do both, I think it's fine. You just need the manpower and you need to keep it separate, like have a spray truck and have a mowing truck. I didn't like having a sprayer on the back of my truck and pulling up with lawnmowers. And then I just like, I don't want to hire people and have, I didn't have room to keep everything at the time. You know, we got more space now, but so anyway, that was kind of it. And then between the two of them, I was definitely making more money spraying than I was mowing. Um, so that was kind of an easy decision. I was like, well, I'm going I'm to only do one of these. I know which one it's going to be. It's going to be, you know, when you go do the same yard, you mow it. And I made fifty dollars. It took me forty five minutes, and then I go spray, and it took seven minutes. And I charge them sixty dollars. I'm thinking, man, I think I'll do this. So that's kind of the way it went. That makes a lot of sense. Well, friends, we're gonna have more with Jason Krill. Uh, did I say it right? That was probably your best of the day. All right, we'll have more with Jason and Doctor Frank coming up. All right, off air, Dr. Frank's trying to recruit Jason to listen to one of our episodes when you were sharing your uh, tips for us on life. <laughs> yeah, it's so interesting, though, how Paul started his business and uh, the different evolution of his thinking and how his life situation kept evolving. Jason or me? No, Jason. Okay, you said Paul. Oh, I meant to say Jason, sorry. Well, Frank, no, well, you remember one thing I told Paul, and Paul probably remembers this, when he... Paul wasn't too far in his podcast, and I called Paul, talked to him one day, and I said, you know what? I love that uh, interview with that doctor guy talking about the keto diet, and and uh, that's before I had met you, you know, and so I definitely listened to that one. I learned a lot from that. Oh, it was like on cellular health. It wasn't just keto, but that right. was part of it. I do more than the keto, but uh, anyway, getting back, now that I got your name right, <laughs> it's very interesting <laughs> about how you evolved and how you're thinking about business changed and really what i like about what you were saying is that uh, because you're an entrepreneur and you're a business for yourself and you have been for a lot of years now you you uh, you made decisions in the business to go this way and that way based on the kind of life you wanted to live and as your lifestyle changed or you had more kids and more family obligations and different situations different types of business became more appealing and you, you had that freedom to do that yeah, I think that's something, honestly, has been the biggest challenge with the lawn care business is 
trying to figure out how to balance making money. You, you can any you can make money in lawn care. I mean, there's no doubt about it. You can also work yourself to death, and it's all you do is just do lawn care. And so I was trying to and still wrestle with this, but how can I make the most money and, and, and not consume my entire life? Like even on YouTube, like I can wake up every day and go shoot another video and another video and another, and I'm not, I'm not saying it's bad, but I'm, I, if you're going to do that and go run the lawn business, and, and so I'm trying to think, how can I also excel in other areas of life? Like, uh, like even you guys, I thought when we were at the uh, Hype House, I thought one thing was great. Y'all have kind of built in habits into your life of trying to eat, a, you know, fairly healthy and exercise. And I thought, you know, it's not good long term to not ever see your kids because you work all the time, to not ever eat healthy because you just go get fast food because you just work all the time or never exercise. So I'm trying to, you know, not just be the greatest lawn care person ever and neglect all other areas of life. I want to try to be excellent in other areas too. And and, it's, and that's a challenge. I'm not saying it's easy, but that's kind of the, because just making money, I mean, yeah, we can make money. I can go out there and just work from 6 a.m. I can work Christmas Eve if I want to, but I don't, you know, that's not the life I want to have. Yeah, everything in life has a price tag. And what we always have to do is continually make the decision is whether we can afford it or not. Not necessarily in terms of money, but in terms of the toll and the price that it takes on our life. Yes. And everybody has to make that decision for themselves. One question that I had, though, is when you were talking about specializing in doing the spraying and the fertilizing, uh, in addition to the lawn care, and how you, you, you really mentioned that it was very time efficient in terms of the amount of hours you had to put in it and the return that you got from it. But it was also a specialization. What was more important? Was it the fact that it was a specialization or the fact that it was just time efficient? Man, that's a good question. I don't think I've ever been asked that. Uh, if I had to, if I don't know. I'm going to choose one just because I hate saying I don't know. But I'm going to choose the efficiency part because I think if you were like super, super efficient in mowing grass, you, you'd, you'd still make a lot of profit even if it's not that specialized but both of those are very much true and that was the other thing I was I wasn't I forgot this while ago Paul but basically when I started mowing and spraying you know the mowing guys don't necessarily want to send me their customers to spray if I'm mowing too because I'm their competitor but when I said hey I'm just the spray guy now all these local mowing guys they know me as a spray guy they send me the the spraying customers you know and vice versa i send them the one customer so i was no longer their competition and that really helped a lot and that's honestly one of the best ways i get customers is just getting to know the local people that are mowing lawns well here's how i'm taking your answer then it was actually multiple factors that synergistically made it very profitable and worthwhile doing it was um, the fact that it was time efficient, but that specialization, I would think, uh, made it less of a commodity so that uh, everybody's out there mowing and people generally have an idea in their head, well, I can get this lawn mowed uh, cheaper by this guy. And they, they kind of often the can become a race to the bottom if yes. you've got a lot of competition and it becomes more like a commodity. But when you specialize, People don't really have a lot of people to go to for that, and you can charge reasonably what uh, in a wide range, mm -hmm. and and people wouldn't uh, complain about that because they don't really know what they should be paying for that. But if it seems reasonable, they'll pay it. And so I think you got a lot of factors going on all at the same time. How would you respond to that? Yeah, I think it, it definitely you can charge a little bit more because it's specialized, but then also it, I'm only doing seven apps a year. So let's say you're paying $60 to have your grass cut, and I say, well, it's going to be 75 to spray it. They're not like freaking out because it's seven times a year. Now the mowing might be twenty five times a year, you know. So they look at it for the over the course of the year. It's like, yeah, it's only seven times a year. I can do that, you know. So, um, and, and seven times a year. That's the that's the little bit of the downside with the spray. And as you can't go out there with fifty customers and make a living. I mean, you because I'm only doing it seven times a year. I've got to have hundreds of customers. I mean, it probably took three hundred customers to fill my schedule up, and that can be a little intimidating for somebody. How do I get three hundred customers? Well, I mean, I got like a hundred the first year. I found it actually easier to get customers for weed control, but I think mostly because it's specialized and there's not near as much competition. And you got a lot of referrals. 
That's probably right. more than the lawn care, right? Yeah, when you get customer, you get established. You know, if I got 300 customers, well, then that's 300 people that can vouch for me. And then, I mean, honestly, I turn it down business now because I don't. I, I'm not saying I'm. I'm still trying to grow. I'm. I'm very selective in who I take on because I'm trying to keep a really tight route. Yeah. What would, what would, go ahead, Dr. Frank. No, I was just going to say I like that last comment, too, about trying to be very selective about your customers and probably even firing your bad customers. I have fired a couple. I fired one this year. I fired one just the other day, and it, I, wouldn't, I try not to be ugly about it, but he, he um, it was $44. His yard was $44, and uh, and I, and I he didn't pay, and he's been a customer for a while, but he, he, he moved in a new house, and it's $44. And it, I've always emailed the invoice to this business account, and he told me email it to him. I didn't get paid. I call him. He says, he says, um, why don't you come out and pick up the the money in my house? I said, like, I really don't want to do that. I said, how about I just text you the invoice? You click on it, you pay it. He said, oh yeah, that works. Well, the next day comes around, it's time to spray his yard again. He didn't pay it. I call him again. I said, hey, I sent you the link. What happened? You didn't pay. He, he says, I, I go buy go buy my son's uh, business and go pick up the forty four dollars. <laughs> I said, okay, because I, and so I go by the son. Oh, the son did No, I go by the son because the son's always want to pay. Oh. I tell the son the story. The son says, I said, son, you're the one that told me to email it to the business account like I always have. He says, why are you coming here yelling at me? And he said, I, you know, the fact, he said, I ain't got nothing to do with me. This has got to do with my dad. I said, well, you the one that's always paid it. You told me to email it to this account. And he, sure enough, while I'm sitting there arguing with him, old dad comes walking in. He pulls his wallet out and hands me the money. And I walked out of there thinking, this won't happen again. This will be your last $44 I chased down. He then sent me on it. And, oh, and he, and he said, when he's handing me the money, he says, I wasn't uh, trying to send you on a wild goose chase or anything. I said, that's exactly what you did, man. You had me. And unfortunately, it wasn't very far away. But just the principle of the thing, man. I said, I got hundreds of customers i'm supposed to come over here and drive around and text you this and do that and i was like so i called him recently and i, I, I did make a point of this i think in those situations you should at least have the courtesy to call the person i wasn't going to just send him a text i mean you know so i called him and he didn't answer so i just left him a voicemail i said hey you know i appreciate your business over the years but uh you know last time it, you sent me on a little bit of a goose chase to get the money so i'm, I'm gonna let uh let you move forward with another provider, you know. So, and that was the end of it. He, he took never, it nicely. He never called by I me. Mean, I, you know, if he would have, he'd yell at me. I don't care. But I mean, you know, it's just a principle thing. You don't do people like that. It's, it's not you, it's me. What's, what's the line? Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know the line. <laughs> it's, 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 uh, uh, all right. Um, I want to ask you a question, Jason, uh, because you were talking earlier about 300 customers, kind of the threshold to make your schedule full make it a full-time living. There's guys listening that are out there on the mower thinking they've been interested in doing um, fertilization. You know what? Next year, I just want to go all in on fertilization, get my rig set up, do it. How do you get from zero to 300 or maybe 20 customers to 300? Well, what's the best marketing plan for an area? We'll use, we'll use this area. There's some cookie cutter neighborhoods around here. It's not Atlanta where there's a lot of them, but there's some, but what would be mm. a marketing plan? If you were starting all over, New company, zero customers, and a little bit of money to market. What yeah. would you do? So me moving to a new area, I mean, I, we had some family in town. So, I mean, we had some connections and stuff you like that. You got no connection. You're just, yeah. there's no, no, okay. no, nothing propping right. you up. You, you got to start with zero. Yeah. You got to figure out the, the neighborhoods where the people are going to pay. You know, don't waste your time driving around in, in places where nobody cares about that kind of stuff. So anyway. Fortunately, in our area, it's a growing city. There's a lot of neighborhoods, a lot of demand for our services. But uh, what I did, I got on Facebook, and I get in these local Facebook uh, groups. So, uh, and I start, I just start searching for the keyword lawn, you know. And it would be somebody in the Facebook group saying, "I'm looking for somebody to mow my lawn," or "I'm looking for somebody to spray my lawn," or something. Well, then I'd start looking in the comments and see who I was getting recommended, and it was like. 50 people that they recommend to mow their lawn and so i started calling those people i said hey um you know i'm jason i'm a weed control fertilization business i know you mow lawns i used to mow lawns too but if you know i don't know if you have a weed control guy that you're sending your customers to if not i would love to be that person so i would offer to meet them for breakfast i'd offer to go spray their lawn whatever i had to do to kind of initiate that relationship so that was one thing i mean when i first moved in i would actually go out on saturdays and knock on doors i don't like doing that but it was pretty uncomfortable but it definitely works especially in the springtime 
Uh, I did some direct mail, things like that. But to me, the, you know, the social media is kind of where it's at. And then I tell people, too, you know, it may not pay off the first year. But if you're going to be in it, go ahead and get you a website and start this search engine optimization process. Because now, I don't think it's even close. Even more than the referrals I get, my website brings me more leads than anything else because I rank well in the local area so you know again that might not happen the first year but it, why would you not take advantage of the uh, the best opportunity you have to bring customers for, for you know, now people. when you did the direct mail were you doing postcards or were you doing uh, letters with an envelope i did uh postcard i did like the uh, every door direct mail through the post I, I didn't have a great experience with that and then I did one of these, like, they call it money mail or something. They stick your little flyer in there with about 50 other flyers. It was way cheaper, but, I mean, the return was pathetic. But <laughs> well, um, That's but different than the postcards, very though. Cheap. You probably did better with the postcards, E-D-D-N, didn't you? Yeah, was it I did everything? better with it, but it was so expensive. I was like, man, this to me, none of that can compete with just getting out there, building relationships with people. And I'm not talking about real estate agents. I'm not, I'm not ugly on them, but, like, they're they're not – connected to your industry like somebody who's out there mowing lawns you know real estate person calls you when they need something mowed tomorrow's for the pictures on the next day you know like that but like a mowing guy they're taking care of this customer's lawn and they want a good weed control guy also taking care of that lawn so that yard looks good you know so that's that's the connection you need just one more question though about the direct mail uh, were you driving them from the direct mail to your website, or you didn't have your website at that point? I think I had the website, but I also put my phone number on there. But I mean, I you know, it it was just expensive. My return now, I think stuff like that. What the marketer says, you got to do it over and over and over again. So, well, I might go broke if I keep doing it over and over again. You know, yeah. sometimes the big companies do that, but I don't think a small timer has to do that. I think you can. Uh, focus more on relationships and on uh, the internet and social right. media. There's nothing cheaper than the internet. Yeah, I love the internet and word of stuff mouth like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Jason, I really appreciate you sharing a little bit of your story. Uh, before we uh, button things up, as Fullerton says, uh, what about flyers, uh, the door hanger flyer thing? I used to do that a lot. I, I I think what I when I was going out knocking on doors on Saturday, if they were if they didn't answer, I would leave a door, a, a door hanger door or, hanger. or a, a well designed postcard was better. Okay, uh, and those do those can work. I mean, you got to kind of hit the right neighborhood. Like if they're still like we have a neighborhood right down the road, they're building hundreds of houses and they're selling as fast as can as they can. So you got a lot of people coming in. I used to live in a military town. And so every summer you had this new wave of military people moving into the nice neighborhoods. Well, they didn't know anybody in town. So if you could time it right, you know, stuff like that could be very effective. Uh, so it, it's you just got to hit or miss on those things. That's how I got Ricardo Allen when he was the um, safety of the Atlanta Falcons and the captain. The coach Henderson lived in his house before him. A new Coach Henderson sold it to him. So Coach Henderson moved out to his new fancy house. This house was already fancy, but he got even a nicer house. And I was driving through the neighborhood, and I saw Ricardo Allen in his, by his front door. And I hop out of my truck real quick. I had a um, Los Angeles Chargers official shirt on. I looked pretty sharp. You know, I, was, I walk up. I was like, hey, I'm Paul. I do so-and-so's yard. I do Coach Smith. I'm, I'm name dropping. And, and I was like, I'd love to keep taking care of this place. And he's like, yeah, man, yeah, man. Give me your phone. You know, and we did numbers. Bam, I got it. It was right there. I hopped on it before anyone else could pitch him. There you go. It's all about timing sometimes. I'd say, you, you like to think sometimes that these customers – that like, hey, I'm going to put a postcard on their door in January, and they'll they'll think about it for months. But usually it's a spur-of-the-moment decision. It's like April, my grass is a foot tall. Whoever knocks on my door first, that's who I'm hiring. You know, it's not something they, like, put a lot of thought into usually. Yeah. Um, it's talking about putting thoughts into stuff. You uh, created a program um, where you have a whole bunch of videos, a whole bunch of resources. By the time you guys hear this, I can't guarantee it'll be 397 bucks. I'll try to encourage Jason to bump up his price a little bit, but tell us a little bit about your um, bundle and, and what's included for someone who wants to learn more about building a fertilization, lawn mowing. Uh, you, you've been in this biz for a while and you put, put together your best thoughts. Yeah. So it's, I call it the weed control fertilization Academy. 